Okay, and we'll do some sharing. Okay, here we are. We're on class number 13. It's the last teaching class for Bible Survey 1.5. We're going to finish off the uh, life and ministry of Christ in the Gospels today. And the class will probably be shorter, unless I get really, really talkative, which I don't imagine. But it should be shorter. There are far fewer slides than in the previous classes. We'll come to the end of the class, and then you can have a time of uh, prayer and intercession for each other. <laughs> because the next thing is the exam. And the exam will be sent out, sent out tomorrow. I'll have it all ready for you. If you encounter any problems with the exam, if you think that, you know, I've made a mistake, then probably I have. <laughs> so you can send me an email and I'll try to, to uh, correct the mistake as soon as possible for you, okay? So today, here we are where we've made it this far. Hallelujah. Thanks for being with us. We're looking at Jesus' final days in Jerusalem. This is period number 20. And yeah, we were talking about Jesus on the cross. Okay, that's where we left him. He had just um, had his conversation with the two thieves on the cross. One of them rejected Christ. One of them received Christ. And we said that that's, in general, that's the, that's the response that Jesus always receives. Some people love him and receive him and accept him, and others reject him. That's the response that we experience when we share the gospel with people. For some people, they hear the truth and they recognize the truth, but they reject it, which is a sad thing. But thank God for those who receive the gospel, who receive the truth, and who make Christ their Savior. So here we are, Jesus' final hours on the cross and some startling events. Let's read. Around noon, about three hours before Jesus died, an eerie darkness covered the land. It was very strange. It struck fear into everyone, Roman soldiers and even the Jewish leaders. Anyone that had anything to do with Jesus' crucifixion felt this sense of fear and dread like what are what is happening here what have we done at the moment of jesus his death the earth trembled from an earthquake and the heavy curtain or the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top down to the bottom The curtain in the temple separated the holy place from the most holy place, and only the priest was allowed, the high priest was allowed behind this curtain once a year on the Day of Atonement. And this tearing of the curtain signified that Jesus had atoned or had paid the price for human sin, and that all people now had equal access to God's love and peace. So, the veil is torn, the curtain is torn from top, from the heaven down to earth. And now it's lying there useless. It's no longer needed because there is access to God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's peace because of Christ. Only Matthew's gospel reports that the earthquake at Jesus' death caused the tombs of many believers to break open and that they came out of their graves. Okay, so they weren't, they weren't zombies. They had been resurrected, okay? They, they came out of their graves. So there had been some believers, some believers in Jesus who had passed away before Christ's crucifixion. I, we don't know how many, but there were some. <clears throat> And when Christ died, when he said, you know, into your hands I commit my spirit, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit, the earth shook, there was an earthquake, the veil was torn, and 
graves opened up and there was this resurrection of believers. After Jesus' resurrection, three days later, these believers went into Jerusalem and the Bible says that they appeared unto many. So this was another proof of who Jesus Christ was. That even in his death, he had power to raise people from the dead. God raised people from the dead. Nobody knows what became of these believers. Okay, They, they came back to life. They, people who had known them saw them again. Maybe the disciples knew some of these people and saw them again. Matthew certainly knew something about it. But nobody knows, nothing is recorded what happened to these believers. Of course, they eventually, they eventually died, just like Lazarus died and all the other people that Jesus raised from the dead. Eventually, they died. They died and went to heaven. After Jesus died, a man named Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for permission to claim his body. He wanted to bury Jesus' body and bury it in his own tomb. Joseph had been a secret follower of Jesus, but now he stepped forward to declare his loyalty to Jesus. So if Joseph was a secret follower of Jesus, probably there were others as well. Joseph was a wealthy man. Maybe he didn't want to jeopardize his business or something, so he was not... <laughs> He was sort of hiding his faith in Christ. But now this changed. Now this changed. He got courage and he came forward. He went to the Roman governor Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And he was going to bury Jesus in a new tomb, a tomb that he had carved out of the rock for himself and for his family. But Jesus was actually going to be the first person to use it. Okay, so you think about it, it's a family tomb, a family tomb. And like Joseph is saying, like Jesus is like family to me, like a brother to me. I want to honor him by burying him in my tomb. The tomb was nearby, nearby. And that was important because, uh, you know, in, in Jewish culture, when a person dies, you're supposed to, bury the body on the same day of the person's death before sundown so fortunately joseph's tomb was nearby and they were able to put jesus there in this act of love and boldness joseph was joined by nicodemus the pharisee with whom jesus had discussed being born again way back at the beginning of his ministry in john chapter 3. So Joseph and Nicodemus claimed the body, and they were the ones, well, we'll read it here. <laughs> we'll look at the Jewish burial customs. Joseph and Nicodemus put aromatic spices among the folds of cloth around Jesus' body before placing him in the tomb. The Jews buried a person quickly after death using spices to mask the odor when the body began to decay. Joseph's tomb was hewn or carved out of solid rock. It was closed and secured by rolling a flat circular stone across the entrance to keep out animals and also grave robbers. Okay, so sometimes wealthy people like Joseph would be buried with some of their wealth, some of their personal possessions you know, made out of, you know, gold or silver or whatever, like family heirlooms, and they would be buried in there. So he, his tomb was made out of solid rock. It was, and they put a big, big stone to keep out people so that the valuable things inside would not be carried away by people outside. So Jesus' body was placed in Joseph's tomb sometime before sundown, on Friday, he had to be buried before the Sabbath began. Because then there would be all these Sabbath rules that would be broken if they were burying him after sundown. I remember 
You're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. Well, burying a body, wrapping it in linen and spices, that would be considered to be work. So they quickly took his body down from the cross, cleaned it, began wrapping it in linen as according to their traditional ways, put some herbs in there to prevent, you know, smell from decay. But they had to do it quickly, so it wasn't, he wasn't completely uh, cared for the way that they norm, the, the, the way that the Jews would normally care for their dead. You know, we see the women coming back, you know, on Sunday morning to finish the job. They brought even more spices and herbs and things for the body because Joseph and Nicodemus weren't able to completely finish the job. They just did what we would call a rush job, the best they could within the short amount of time that they had. So Jesus was placed in the tomb, the stone was put in front of it, and he is, his body there is dead. The Gospels record several important events in connection with Jesus' resurrection because Jesus did not stay in the tomb. So women came to Jesus' grave. Now these were the same women who had watched Jesus die on the cross. They hurried to his tomb shortly after sunrise on Sunday morning because they wanted to finish the job of anointing Jesus' body with spices. This, this, because Joseph and Nicodemus had started it two days before, but they hadn't finished. These women were shocked to see that the huge stone that had once sealed the tomb was rolled away and that Jesus' body was gone. Okay, The whole purpose for them coming there was to minister to Jesus' dead body, but it wasn't there. Inside the tomb, the women found two angels who asked them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Like, why are you looking for a living person here in a grave? You know, living people don't live in, in graves unless you're like that, what, that demon-possessed man that had, you know, the legions of demons in him. He lived out among the graves. But most people who are not demon-possessed are not living in a tomb. They said, he is not here. Jesus has risen. And then the angels told the women to go and tell the disciples that Jesus had been raised from the dead. So it was the women who were there at the cross who witnessed his death, and the women were also the first witnesses of Christ's resurrection. When Peter and the other disciple, that's how John refers to himself in his gospel, when the other disciple John heard the news from the women, they hurried off to the tomb. It was kind of a foot race. Peter entered the tomb ahead of John, even though John arrived first, he didn't enter in first. Peter boldly just went right in. And he noticed that the burial cloth that had been wound around Jesus' head was not lying with the burial shroud, you know, the, the shroud that covered his body. But this burial cloth had been folded up and put into a separate place by itself. This indicated to them that something supernatural had happened, that the fact that this cloth had been folded up carefully, neatly, and put into a separate place by itself. That probably, if, if it was grave robbers, they probably would not have done something like that. Jesus' body had miraculously passed through the cloth just as it later went through closed doors. So like the burial shroud of Jesus, you know, this big sheet that would cover the whole body was just lying there on the stone slab. You know, it wasn't like Jesus 
Jesus took the shroud, you know, from over his head. You know, like 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 we we pull off a blanket, we remove a blanket, and you know it it would the blanket would normally be you know maybe you know you know when we kick the blankets off the bed or a sheet off the bed it would be all messed up it'll be all balled up and shoved over to the side, but the shroud was still in the same position that it had. That, that it was in when Joseph and Nicodemus buried Jesus. It's just that Jesus' body was not under the shroud. It still was flat out there on, on the slab, as though his body had just passed through it. And then he, he got up, he took off the burial cloth, he folded it neatly and set it aside. So Jesus' body, his glorified resurrection body could just pass through things. It passed through the shroud, and later on the disciples would see that he just passed right through closed doors. He could walk through walls. John came into the tomb right behind Peter, and John said that when he entered the tomb, he saw and believed. He saw and believed. Like, what he saw he believed. He believed what he was seeing. He believed that something supernatural, wonderful, and awesome had happened there. But then in the very next verse, John remarks that the disciples still did not understand the scriptures that said that Jesus must rise from the dead. So, I mean, they had heard from the women, we we saw angels, and the angels said that Jesus is risen. He's risen from the dead. And so they go running off, and they look, and John sees the shroud. He sees the head cloth. He sees and believes. But somehow it still didn't register. It didn't click. It even though Jesus had said many times, I'm going to rise from the dead, I'm going to die on the cross and rise from the dead on the third day. Still, hmm, they did not understand the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. So he is alive, but, hmm, you know, I guess he really needed to see Jesus, right? And this, this, this phenomena, we call it the slowness to believe, is one of the greatest arguments for Jesus' resurrection. You know, the, one of the greatest arguments for Jesus' resurrection is that no one expected it to happen. Not even his closest friends. The people that Jesus had told at least three times that he would rise again, but Somehow they still did not expect it to happen. The disciples did not believe the reports that Jesus has risen, even though he had clearly told them that he would. If Jesus' resurrection was just a made-up story, the disciples would have been the first to spread this tale throughout Jerusalem. Okay, but they weren't. They weren't the first people to go around saying, He's risen! He's risen! No. No, because they had trouble believing that this had really happened. You know, there are some people, you know, who've written books and say, well, you know, the disciples just made up Jesus. Jesus was not even a real person. Others say, well, Jesus, yeah, Jesus was a good teacher and Jesus died, but he didn't rise again. The, the, the disciples stole his body from the tomb and they made up the story of his resurrection. Because Jesus had said that he would rise again, they made it look like he rose again. They stole his body and they hid the body and then they said, oh, he rose again. But you know what? <laughs> From the stories that we see here, we don't see anything like that. We see the disciples 
having a very difficult time thinking that Jesus actually rose from the dead. They didn't believe it when the women said that. They had to go see for themselves. And they saw something happen there. And something in John's heart said, something happened here, something supernatural. Maybe he did rise from the dead. So when they, when the, after they saw this, what did they do? They went back. They went back to the upper room and they were just sitting around trying to figure out what to do, still living in fear of the Jews. And they weren't expecting Jesus to show up. A few hours after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to two men as they walked from Jerusalem to Emmaus, which is a distance of about seven miles or 11.25 kilometers. And these men had been followers of Jesus. They just weren't one of the 12. As these three walked together, Jesus and these two guys, Jesus did not reveal who he was, but he showed them what the Old Testament scriptures taught about the suffering and glory of the Messiah. Okay, so Jesus is now explaining, showing in the Old Testament where it's revealed that the Messiah would suffer and die and be buried and would rise again. There are prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about the resurrection of the Messiah. When Jesus and the two men reached Emmaus, the two travelers asked Jesus to stop and eat with them. And as Jesus offered thanks for the food, the two men realized that this talkative stranger was Jesus, the Messiah. And when this realization happened, oh, it's him, then Jesus disappeared. Jesus disappeared. And the two men hurried back to Jerusalem, where they told the disciples that they had seen the Lord. So here was more proof that Jesus was alive. The women said that they had seen an angel. The angel said, he is not here, he's risen. Now these two men from Emmaus come running in and say, Jesus is alive. We've seen him. We walked with him. He talked with us. Jesus is alive. Then finally, <laughs> finally, Jesus appeared to all of his disciples when they were together behind locked doors, probably hiding from the Jewish religious leaders and Roman soldiers who had put Jesus to death. So they're in this room, probably the upper room. All the doors are locked. There's no way that anyone could get into the room. But suddenly Jesus materialized right there among them. Somehow he got past these walls, he got past these locked doors with his resurrection body, and there he was. He was there in their midst. Just like he disappeared from the room where the, the guys from Emmaus were eating, suddenly he appears in the upper room with the disciples. And he's there, and it's him. And they recognize him. And Jesus... Jesus is really cool. He greets his disciples with the customary Jewish hello, peace be unto, like, shalom, here I am, hi. You know, he, it wasn't like a big, here I am, you know, the trumpets blasting or anything like this. It was just like, hey, nice to see you again. Peace be unto you. It's been a few days. Here I am. It's me, Jesus. And of course, oh, I'm sure that they were terrified at first. Maybe they thought that he was a ghost or a spirit. Maybe they thought they were hallucinating. But no, it's Jesus. And so he goes on to assure them, this is me, okay? And just like I promised, I'm going to be sending the Holy Spirit to strengthen you for the task of continuing my work in the world. Jesus is, he's, Jesus is just picking up right where he left off. You know, he had talked about these things 
the night before his crucifixion, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He is going to guide you into all truth. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to comfort you. You know, all these different things. He is the spirit of truth. He's going to teach you. And so he says, yeah, here, we, here I am, better than ever. Yep, here I am, but I, like I told you before, I'm not going to stay here forever. I'm going to be going to my Father. So, But the Holy Spirit is coming. He will do everything I told you that he would do. And you have a mission now. You are going to continue my work. Now, one of the disciples wasn't there, Thomas. He wasn't there on that occasion. And when he did show up, Jesus was already gone at that point. And he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my feet where the nails were, put my finger, my feet, put my finger where the nails were, I will not believe. Ah, I don't believe you. <laughs> so one week later, Jesus appeared again to his disciples and Thomas was there. And he invited Thomas, touch the wounds, touch the wounds. You want to stick your fingers in the nail scars? Go right ahead. You want to stick your hand in my side where the spear, Roman spear went in? Go right ahead. <laughs> but Thomas like, no, 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 Lord, Lord, I believe. You know, he called him Lord, my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But we are those blessed ones, right? We are those who have not seen Jesus Christ in a physical body. Whether, yeah, the glorified physical body. Yet we believe. We are blessed because of our faith. And Jesus was speaking of future believers like us who would base their faith on the testimony of those who had seen the Lord. Now, this testimony is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and even in the book of Acts, because Paul, at that time Saul, saw the Lord. And he has a testimony of how he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And we read these stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and we base our faith in Jesus Christ on the testimony of those eyewitnesses, of those eyewitnesses. Blessed are those, you and I, who have not seen and yet have believed. Okay, Jesus is coming to the end of his time on earth. He meets his disciples in Galilee. He made one of his very final appearances to his disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. And there were several of Jesus' his disciples there, Peter, Thomas, James, John, and two other disciples whose names are not recorded. But they were fishing in the lake when Jesus greeted them from the shore. Uh, some people think that probably one of the disciples was Andrew, Peter's brother, because it's his hometown. I don't know who the other one might have been. Jesus enabled them to make a miraculous catch of fish, then called them to shore where he made a breakfast from some of the fish they had caught. So the, Jesus performs the second miraculous catch miracle. Remember when he first met Peter, James, and Andrew, and John, they had been out fishing all night. They had not caught a thing. And Jesus says, well, go out and throw your nets over the right side of the boat. And they said, oh, sure, okay, whatever you say, Jesus. And they hauled in this huge number of fish. Well, here it is, three, three and a half years later, and the same miracle takes place. They'd been out fishing all night, caught nothing. And Jesus says, lower your nets one more time. And again, a, a miraculous catch of fish. And, you know, they realize it is the Lord. And Peter jumps into the water and swims into the shore to see Jesus. And they bring in the fish and Jesus makes them a fish breakfast. Yeah. 
Not my favorite breakfast, but it was good. It was good for them. Jesus cooked it. After they had satisfied their physical hunger, Jesus turned to Peter to deal with a spiritual matter. Okay, so the physical needs were met. Now Jesus is going to deal with the spiritual needs here of one particular disciple named Peter. Jesus asked Peter if he loved him and then deliberately asked twice more. Remember, he asked Peter, do you love me? He asked it three times. And Peter has to give an answer three times. And it's once for each of Peter's three denials. So Peter says, no, I don't know him. I don't know him. And then curses, I don't know that guy. But now confronted with Jesus, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you really love me? You know I do, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yes, 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 Lord. So he makes up for those three denials with three affirmations of his love for Jesus. Peter replied that he loved Jesus three times, and Jesus then assured Peter that he had been forgiven and restored to usefulness as his disciple. You know, we talked about that a bit in, in church yesterday, about, you know, we, we will all fail. We will all fail. You know, as much as we try not to and we don't desire to, we end up, we end up failing. We end up sinning, either through ignorance or sometimes even willfully. But God never gives up on us. Jesus, Jesus' grace and his mercy, his compassion, his love, his kindness, his patience with us is always there. And we see it here in Jesus' life as he's dealing with Peter. He knew, he knew that this would happen. Remember, he told Peter, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. He said, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. He's talking to all the disciples. But then he says, but Peter, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that when this is all over, you will be restored. And Jesus knew. So when Peter denied him three times, Jesus was not shocked. You know, he remembers that we're dust, right? We're weak, we're frail. We still have an old sin nature that we wrestle with. And so God has a provision for all of that. God has a provision for us. It's called his grace and his mercy his love, his forgiveness, his compassion, his great kindness, and his amazing, long-suffering patience with us. And he doesn't throw people away. He doesn't throw people away. You know, the, the bruised reed he will not break, the smoking flax he will not quench. God has always got a plan to redeem us, to restore us, to bring us back to him. Put us back on, the, on our feet and moving forward with him. And so Jesus told Peter, again, just like at the very beginning, follow me. Follow me. He's saying, follow me, minister in my name. The past is past. Let's go forward. So now Jesus is near, very close there to the very, very end. It's his next step. He's telling them what is going to happen next. And Jesus left no doubt about what he expected his disciples to do after his earthly ministry came to a close. He just summed everything up with this expectation that he expressed in a few words known as his great commission. This is Matthew 28, 19, and 20. He said, go. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what is, his, what is his expectation? Go and make disciples. 
Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And I will be with you. I will be with you every step of the way. You won't see me. You won't see me, but I'm there. My Holy Spirit will be with you. He will live inside of you. I'm going to be at the right hand of God the Father, and I'm going to be interceding for you, praying for you as you go and make disciples and baptize and teach. This is, this is my commission to you. That was his expectation for the disciples that were there in front of him and also for us as Christ's disciples as well. And this is some of his last words that he speaks to them before he goes to heaven. You know, the Great Commission is Jesus' orders for his church, the body. The, the orders come from the head to the body of Christ. Jesus expected his church to be a living, moving force that spread his message of God's love and grace throughout the entire world. And Jesus, when he said go, <laughs> you know, go meant stepping out of their familiar surroundings to speak to total strangers and bring them into God's kingdom in order to nurture them into effective followers of Christ the Savior. Some of the last words that are recorded in John's Gospel, uh, Jesus speaks to Peter and he says, you know, th there will come a day where you will be carried someplace that maybe you would rather not go. And he was re referring to like when Peter, when he was older, was taken to Rome and put in prison there. And, you know, Peter eventually was crucified there in Rome. He was, he was executed by the Roman government. Sometimes that's what going means, right? We're, we're going, we're following in the steps of the Savior. You know, today's devotional that I wrote was talking about, you know, suffering for Christ's sake. Suffering for Christ's sake. The servant is no greater than his master. And also, you know, the, 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 the student becomes like the teacher. Well, Jesus was the teacher, the rabbi. The disciples were the students. They became like him as they followed in his footsteps. And following in Christ's footsteps... You know, where, does, where did Christ's footsteps lead him? It led him to the cross. It led him to the cross and beyond into, you know, resurrection life. And so we should not be uh, discouraged or dismayed when we see the cross popping up in our life, when we see persecution or suffering happening in our life. It's all part of being like Christ. And it makes us Christ-like when we go through these things. And Jesus said, yes, you've got, when you need to go. You need to go. Go like I, I am going. And spread, spread the message of God's love and grace throughout the entire world. And when they weren't going for a while, I mean, we'll see this when we go into the book of Acts, you know, when they kind of weren't going, out of Jerusalem, God sent, allowed persecution to happen. Remember with the death of Stephen? Many people, then they decided to go. And they went to Judea. And then they went to Samaria. And some of them went even further. They went into the other parts of the earth. Because of persecution and suffering, the message got spread. You know, Jesus says go, and he means it, <laughs> you know. So it's better when we just obediently go. But even if we don't go in, in obedience right away, you know, as long as we go when, he, when he's, like, giving us a push, that's great. So, yeah, Jesus' final words is like, let's go, let's go. You have a message. You have a mission. You're an ambassador. You've got the gospel. You've got the Holy Spirit. Let's go. You know, this command 
that we did we read in Matthew 28 19 and 20 is just a brief summary of Christ's continuing work in the world through the church like the church is the body of Christ we are the manifestation of the head you know and we are to reveal Christ through our through the ministry of the gospel by going and the account of how this work was carried out in the early years of the Christian movement will be discussed in future classes. We're going to take a look at the book of Acts, and then we'll look into the epistles, and we'll see how the, how the disciples carried out the Great Commission, how they went. They were told to go, and how did they go? What did they do? So we'll talk about the early church in future classes. And when we get into, I'm calling it Bible Survey 2.0. Bible Survey 2.0, where we go from Acts to the book of Revelation. And I've started preparing that class so that we can have another final, last semester of Bible Survey and finally finish the entire Bible. So I hope you'll join us for that when we get to that class. It won't be starting next week because I'm not that prepared yet, but maybe in a couple weeks we'll, we'll start class again and we'll finish the New Testament. But that's the last slide that we have for today. I told you today's class was gonna be shorter than usual. So here we are. At, at the, I'm gonna stop sharing look at the screen I can see all your names and I'm asking you hey what are we gonna any comments or questions that you have right now it's not a meaningful com comment <laughs> but a funny okay expression sure a talkative stranger yes yes <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jesus be was like a stranger to them and he was very talkative. Like he knew what he was talking about, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that has ever been written about me in the Old Testament, I'm going to share it with you. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, I like that too. And um, people uh, came out of there too. Mm. Curious. Yes. Curious, kind of mysterious is one of the yeah. things that people wonder about, like, mm. what was that all about? <laughs> Except that maybe it's just another evidence to help people to believe about who Jesus was. Mm. But that's all, the only mention of it. And so we don't know, you know, really what these people did, how much longer they lived. I suppose they would all to uh, to be just an evidence. Yes. Oh, Jesus resurrection. Amen. Yeah. And we'll meet them in heaven. We can ask them, "What did you guys do?" <laughs> when all of a sudden, you know, oh, there's an earthquake, and all of a sudden you're alive again, and you're walking out of your tomb, and you're discovering like, oh, it's the Passover. I guess I should get home someplace. Their families must have been very surprised to see them. Must have been a very happy Passover for some families. Anyone else? I just, I, I, you know, those two men on the road to Emmaus, and then later on, the disciples themselves were sitting there listening to Jesus talk about the Old Testament scripture and pointing out to them every single prophecy that pointed to himself to prove that he was the fulfillment of the scriptures. To hear it from Jesus' own mouth. Mm. When Jesus 
talks to his disciples, he used simple and easy words. Mm. Not complicated or difficult vocabularies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, the beauty of Christianity. Mm -hmm. yes. We do not brag about our knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, the gospel is is very simple and straightforward, right? And God God tells us everything that we need to know in this life about himself. Mm -hmm. There's so much more to know, but we don't need to know it right now. And we'll spend all eternity just learning, getting to know God. And enjoying it, loving yeah. it. Yeah. Anyone else want to share anything? I want to walk with the talkative stranger <laughs> today. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Yeah, they, they heard his voice, right? Wow. Michael, Michael Hong in our church loves, there's two hymns that use the lyrics like, he walks with me and he talks with me. You know, the one is the In the Garden song. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. He loves that. That's the idea, like the talkative Jesus. Mm. You know, he walks with us and he talks with us and he shares his life, he shares the truth with us. Hmm. Instead of, you know, you know, I, I think it's so crazy that people still in some parts of the world, they, they worship idols who have ears but don't hear and they have mouths but they don't speak, eyes that they do not see. And yet we have we have a God who is like a real person, who has he hears us and he speaks to us. And uh, he sees us, he knows us as a personal, personal savior. You know, and, and Jesus was the evidence of that. God as a person. God as a person. You know, there's you know, there was a song that came out, I don't know how many years ago. I think it was sung by Bette Midler. And I think her, the lyrics of her song was like, what if God were one of us? And it's like, well, okay, you want to know? Read the Gospels. Okay. God became one of us. Jesus Christ showed us. What would God what would God be like if he were a man? There he is, Jesus Christ. You know, so you don't we don't have to sing songs and speculate about that because it actually happened. Because God is very personal, very relational. He's not a something, he's a someone. So everything about God is personal. His holiness is personal, his love all of his attributes, very personal, relational, not abstract, and simple, like you said, Anne. So, you know, getting to know God, as we said in the last Wednesday night's message, is like, how do you get to know a person? You spend time with them. You eat with them. You, you take a journey with them. You take a trip with them. That's how you get closer to people. Same thing with God. And God is very available. Very available all the time to do any of those things. He's always trying to initiate to us. It's usually us that say, well, I'm busy. I'm, I'm not available right now. 
but yeah, we just need to set aside time and consciously, you know, do these things with Christ. Any last thoughts or questions? Otherwise, I'm going to pray and wrap things up here and take a one last look at our exam. Any questions about the exam? Okay, you must know what to expect by now. Let's pray. <laughs> oh, Karen, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, so we have an exam, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, tomorrow we have no class, right? Right, I'll send, I'll send you the exam tomorrow. <laughs> yes. In, okay. in, in place of class, in place of listening to me, you're taking the exam. But if you don't have to do it tomorrow, I'll give you like a week or so to do it. Okay. Uh, I agree. Tomorrow's class, you, you can take the exam. But don't don't come here on Zoom looking for me because you won't find <laughs> me tomorrow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. All right. So Father God, we thank you for our time together today. Thank you that uh, you spent time with us. It's so important for us to make time for you. You always, you have, you have unlimited time for us because you are always with us. You're always waiting to show yourself gracious to us. You're always initiating your love to us. Lord, just help us to be more sensitive to your initiations and willing to um, spend time with you, Lord, getting to know you, becoming more like you as we walk with you and talk with you and share our lives with you as you share your life with us. Bless each of these students. Thank you for their faithfulness to come to class and to participate and to listen. We pray that you give them uh, great gifts of knowledge when they take the test, if they choose to take the test, Lord, help them to do well and to be uh, use this time to review and be refreshed in the things that we have learned. And just keep us all in your best care. We want to be right there in the palm of your hand until we have Bible college again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.